English, as you've already read, is, is not a pure language. I don't think there really are any pure languages in the world, but English is definitely not a pure language. English, in fact, has borrowed from over 350 languages in its history. So it's a variety of many languages. Some people say it's like a dog, a Mongol dog, a dog that's been made up of many different dogs. The English language is like that. And by looking at the history of the English language, we learn about the history of the English people. The two things are closely connected. So in fact, today, we're not only learning about language, but we're learning about history. And the fact that English has borrowed words from over 350 languages has been viewed differently throughout history. So, for example, in Shakespeare's time, people were very angry about words which were not, they thought, original English words, words which came from other languages. They didn't like them.
Uh, so, look, I'm going to talk today um, really mostly about what I do as a curator um, here at the National Museum, but I want to try and draw some kind of generalities from that in terms of how there's a series of um, curatorial practices, if you like, tools and techniques and methods that I think could be of interest to your students and of interest to you in developing extension history courses. Um, I want to talk about so what I do as a curator and then from that also talk a little bit about the kinds of history that I think museums are particularly good at creating and communicating. Um, I think this is something I'd really like to discuss because I think it's not necessarily very well understood that museums, as Dave insisted by putting up my quote at the beginning of his, at the, at, uh, in his slide, um, is that I think museums create a very particular kind of history. It's not the kind of history that gets created in books or indeed in films or in I don't know, compositions. Um, it's a very particular kind of history that grows out of the fact that museums are centrally interested and defined by their collections. I should say that's not an uncontested view of museums, but it's certainly my view of museums. So curators try to understand material culture as evidence of other people's lives, as a means to try to understand other people, um, what they looked like, what they did, how they made a living, what they hoped for in their lives, how they tried to construct their world, and why they made particular choices. And one way um, in which curators differ from other historians is therefore in, in focus in terms of, of how we interrogate the past, what elements we use to communicate the past. Most academic historians are trained very much in discipline of words, and they concentrate on words, still today, I think, although it's changing a little bit. Um, if you go through university history, I think primarily you are encouraged to draw on things like archival accounts, manuscripts, um, now oral, hist historians, uh, oral histories, and most of that work is actually promulgated in the form of books. There's also other kinds of historians, obviously filmmakers and photographers concentrate on creating images of the world and arrange, arranging them in meaningful sequences. But curators attend to objects. We look at objects as evidence of the past and try to arrange objects in meaningful ways called exhibitions.
Readjusting to life in your own country after living abroad for some time is a little like recovering from jet lag after a long flight across several time zones. It takes time. And research indicates that after nine years of living in a foreign country, you never really do readjust. Of course, things have changed. Governments have come and gone. What you knew as countryside has become a suburb. New technologies have changed the way people go about their daily lives, and so on. These changes may well have been taking place in your adopted country, but they were happening while you were there, so you could adapt as you went along. Those are not the main difficulties, however. It is in the smaller, everyday things that you might experience what is known as culture shock, although it's not really a shock, but puzzling all the same. For example, the precise way to behave at a supermarket checkout may have changed, and in ordinary conversation, the frames of reference have changed, and quite often you find that you don't really know what people are talking about, even though they are speaking your native tongue. Hey, Jeff, have you been to the new library yet? Oh, hi, Jen. Yes, I went last week to check it out. I really like it. Yes, I like it, too. I like the study areas. There seem to be a lot of room to just spread out and focus on the books. It's way better than the old library, where it seemed like we were all jammed into one area. Sometimes it was even hard to find a spot to study because it was so crowded, especially during exams. I even like the chairs at the new place. They're super comfy. You're right. The only bad thing about it is that it's pretty far away. It takes me about 20 minutes to get there by bus, so I can see myself not going all the way downtown if I'm in a pinch for time. I'd probably just stay in the residence and study there. I was thinking that, too. It's too bad it takes so long to get there. I don't like being dependent on the buses. Have you tried riding your bike there? It might take a little longer, but at least you're getting a bit of exercise. That's a good idea, Jen. Maybe I'll try riding this week. I just have to make sure I'm good and rested. Sometimes when I'm overtired, I'm not too coordinated. Knowing me, I'd have a load of books on my backpack and get distracted by something and crash my bike. Hmm. Well, you've just got to keep an eye out for those potholes. Oh, wow. Look at the time. I've got to get to my next class. I'll see you around, Jeff. Good talking to you, Jen. I'll be seeing you. Environment problems caused by hard rock mining involve water pollution by metals themselves, chemicals used in processing, acid drainage and sediment. Metals and metal-like elements in the ore are toxic and prone to cause trouble by ending up in nearby streams and water tables as a result of mining operations. Working together, they figured out that if the government was going to propose some kinds of significant tax increases, which is a good strategy, require me to at least lie something like getting something for those big tax brackets, not seeing any results. So the result of that was in the package of legislation that included the tax increases. There was some awesome information to have significant expansion of coverage families where they can buy into their private insurance. Rebuilding carbon-rich agriculture soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. 
This year, Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. Long-term exposure to noise can lead to loss of hearing. The relative loudness of sounds is measured in decibels. Just to give you an idea of what this means, the sound of a whisper is 30 decibels, while a normal conversation is 60 decibels. The noise a vacuum cleaner makes is around 85 decibels. The danger zone, the risk of injury, begins at around 90 Continual exposure to sounds above 90 decibels can damage your hearing. Loud noises, especially when they come at you every day, all this noise can damage the delicate hair cells in your inner ear. Lots of everyday noises are bad for us in the long run. For example, a car horn sounds at around 100 decibels. A rock band at close range is 125 decibels. A jet engine at close range is one of the worst culprits at an ear-busting 140 decibels. The first thing to go is your high-frequency hearing, where you detect the consonant sounds in words. That's why a person with hearing loss can hear voices, but has trouble understanding what's being said. We are going to discuss mitosis. Mitosis is a process of cell division. As a result of cell division, two daughter cells are produced from a single parent cell. The daughter cells are identical to one another and to the original parent cell. Mitosis includes four phases called prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Let's discuss each phase here. In prophase, each chromosome duplicates to form two sister chromatids. In metaphase, the chromosomes line up at the equatorial plate and are held by microtubules and the centromere. In anaphase, the centromeres divide and sister chromatids separate and move toward the matching poles. Finally, in telophase, daughter chromosomes arrive at the poles and the microtubules disappear. The chromatin expands. The cytoplasm divides and the cell membrane pinches inward producing two daughter cells. I have a problem with my political science class. Literally, I know nothing about it and regret taking it. I should have dropped the class. Calm down, Jane. Students take classes to learn. I know, but I am so clueless. I am just not so into the politics, constitution, and laws. And again, the words are so confusing to me. Jane, let me tell you something. Based on my experience, you just need to try. You know, the words may sound difficult, but they are not at all that difficult. Once you get familiar with the vocabulary, basic laws and events, political science is a very interesting and easy subject. On top of that, you have me to help you. Do you really think so? Yes, I'm sure. Everything's up to you. If you think positively and put effort into it, everything will become easy. Drums can be divided according to shape. Some of the types are tubular, vessel, and frame drums. One of the most common tubular drums is the long drum. A lot of long drums are cylindrical. 
They have the same diameter from top to bottom, like this Polynesian drum. This drum was carved from a length of tree trunk and has a single skin head. For vessel drums, we have the kettle drum. Kettle drums have a single membrane stretched over a pot or vessel body. Vessel drums come in a variety of sizes, from the very large drums of Africa to the very compact and portable drums, like this one from Hawaii. The third type I want you to see is the frame drum. A frame drum consists of one or two membranes stretched over a simple frame, which is usually made of thin. Land animals move easily through air because air does not slow them down. Sea creatures, on the other hand, have to move through water, which is hundreds of times thicker than air. A sea animal has to push itself through water in order to move. Sea animals use many different ways to swim, creep, or glide through water. Fish are able to swim by bending their bodies into waves. They have flattened fins and tails that push against the water like oar blades, converting their body waves into forward movement. The size of a fish's tail contributes to its swimming speed. Small tail fins are found in slow swimmers like the eel. The medium-sized tail of the bass is linked with a medium to fast swimming speed. Long pointed tail lobes like those on the marlin are found only on fast. It seems we now know more about outer space than we do about the Earth's core. This is because temperatures are so high at the center of the Earth that human beings have not been able to take a close look at it. However, new methods of analysis may soon change all that. The seismic waves created by earthquakes and volcanic eruptions penetrate the Earth's layers at different speeds. It is now hoped that by studying these waves, scientists will be able to make new discoveries and solve some of the mysteries of the internal structure of the Earth. The school canteen sells a large variety of water and food. We are researching on the most significant challenges we are facing today. People have been independent by using phones in everyday life. 